Peace and Black Power fam. Yeah, I mean, oh, let me give y'all a full dread. What's going on? Good morning. It is coffee time with Lion. How is everything? Wow. Yeah. So, topic of discussion today is what is the UNIA ACL? It's a lot of discrepancies and misunderstandings going on, especially here in my city. You know what I'm saying? That's all I can deal with is um, local. And um, I got some folks that is uh, misinformed as far as what the UNIA ACL actually is. So here I am today, this morning, to give you a basic overview as far as what the UNIA ACL is, what it is a tool to be used for, and how we can use it. Uh, primarily, we start in Jamaica with Marcus Messiah Garvey um, creating the Universal Negro Improvement Association in 1914. When this happened, he had already traveled the world and, and studied under um, masters of what we would call Pan-Africanism at this point. Um, they hadn't started calling it Pan-Africanism yet, but it was a understanding of universal African nationalism. Um, I got the honor to, of being a descendant of Edward Wilmot Blyton, who was one of the uh, mentors that Garvey credits to his his uh, mindset and doctrine in, in, in his lifetime. Also, Martin Delaney and many others that Garvey actually gives credit to when you start reading like um, Garvey's works you, and he's listen to his speeches, you can hear him say, you can hear him give credit to not only his elders at the time, but his ancestors that had come before him, speaking about unification of our people. So that brought him to a, a thought process of an actual nation of our own. Since we have left um, captivity, uh, when we talk about the enslaved Africans, the enslaved indigenous, however you feel like going with that, um, uh, that's not what we're dealing with right now. Um, once we come out of that, into that time of uh, Jim Crow and things like that, we realize at that point that we are unique people across the globe. We are people without an actual nation. Um, we're talking about those of us that are in the diaspora, not those of us that are still on the continent. So this is worldwide. This is not just in America. We're talking about in the uh, West Indies. We're talking about in South America. We're talking about uh, in England and Asia, okay? All over the world, we are a unique people because we were taken from and deprived of a national heritage, okay, uh, through a, a, an industrial form of breeding and making sure we didn't know who our families was and all types of things, okay? So at that point, 1914, now, Garvey has compiled all of this work, all of this research into who we are as a people. And notice that the one thing that we was missing was that nation. He then um, reads uh, uh, Booker T. Washington up from slavery and gets inspired like, yo, that's a move. We need to get a Tuskegee Institute, something that we build from the ground up, something that teaches us how to build and that uh, forces us to go out and build for us in the future. Um, we need the Tuskegee Institute here in Jamaica is what, what his thought process was. He came to America in 1916 to meet uh, Booker T. Washington, and unfortunately he died before he could do so. But in that travel, he noticed that America, Harlem specifically, was a hub for black people in the diaspora. So he set up camp there, created the Universal Negro Improvement Association dash ACL, the African Communities League. That's when he realized that we need to put out into the world that we need to be unified wherever there are African communities around the world. That's something that has to happen. It's, it's that way with everyone else. And if you listen to his speeches, you will hear him say such. Um, so between 1916 and 1920, he amassed a huge following of people who understood this. He, he, they called, called them race men and race women, people who were actually serious about developing a nation of our own without alien interference, okay? And that was what he set out to build. In 1920, 
before I get to 1920, there's a thing called international law. Okay. So the law of the land in the city that you live in, okay, is different than the law of the land in the state that you live in. It's different than the country you live in. It's also different in the water that's just outside of your, the, the border of your country, right? Out into international waters. All of these things are governed by a set of laws. Now, when we look at international law, and what is a government? You know, we see all the time people say that uh, a government or a nation is its people. It's not necessarily a land. It's not necessarily a place. It's the people. We have many instances through history where groups of people decided that we are going to create this nation here. And we make that decision and we make the presentation to whoever needs to be, to be made to but we're going to do that as a nation, as a government. And that's how a lot of different governments around the world actually began, America included. So, so now we go back to 1920, international law now. So what makes a government? Well, basically, you have to claim that you are a government, right? How do you do so? You create the constitution. We created Declaration of Rights. And what ended up happening a little bit earlier, due to the uh, song, um, Every Race Has a Flag But the Coon, they created, uh, oh, here we go, that way, the red, black, and green flag. The red for the blood of African people, black for the skin of African people, and green for the glorious, glorious land of Mother Africa. Hello? So when they created that flag, that identifies a people. The other races of the world notice so much that in that song, they make sure that they let people know. They talk about the Scottish flag. They talk about the German flag and the pride that those people have in their nation collectively. And they make fun of the fact that we did not have that at the time. Not only did we not have the actual flag, but we didn't have the mindset to have a pride in ourselves as a nation. And they made fun of that. This was uh, equivalent to a top 10 song back then on the Billboard charts, okay? To the point where, just like now, people were ready to, ex Black people were ready to accept that. Like, you know what? They right, man. We not worth nothing. We don't, we don't deserve a flag. We don't deserve a nation of our own. We should be, we should be right where we are. And, and a lot of folks, you know what I'm saying? A lot of righteous race, race people, stood up and said no that's not a that's not right and so hold on, let me turn it down. this is significant too uh, i'm gonna let you know why in a minute. all right so as i was saying um so we create the government international law we got the constitution the declaration of rights the flag the national anthem that goes with that flag and the Pledge of Allegiance that goes with that flag. Now, those things were created so we can have something to hold on to, okay? So when we unify under this, there wouldn't be a question as far as who we're talking about when we make certain statements. So if we are serious about certain changes happening for people that look like us, you don't need to go through all the divisive, divisive titles that people have placed upon us. They say, you must call yourself this in order to gain this. You must call yourself this in order to denounce that. No. Garvey and the 20, over 20,000 Africans that came to Madison Square Garden in 1920, for 30 days of August, 31 days of August, okay? decided that no, we will not just submit to, first of all, your rule, which also includes the rule of your law, because there's something that actually supersedes that. And if we can tap into that seriously, we can gain benefits for people that look like us. 
That way we don't have to have are you in a uh, descendant of ABC? Are you black? Are you African? Are you this? Are you that? We don't even need to deal with that. At a, in the 1920s, when the Garveyite movement was at, at its peak, so you had millions of Africans worldwide who understood that this was the solution, the solution. Where is the other plan? When we talk about asking them for reparations and things like that, that may be a righteous move. I'm not saying don't do that. My question to pe people who would discuss that is now, how do you govern said reparations? When you look at the people, there's a list that goes out, you know what I'm talking about? They talk about how the Jews got reparations and how the uh, Native Americans got reparations and how the Japanese and that, 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 right? All of those folks gained that based on a national outcry, let's say. Nationalism gained them benefits. They were able to go to a table and negotiate based on uh, the same level that the people they were negotiating with. It wasn't a, a master-slave relationship where we where we're asking them to not be so oppressive. <clears throat> it is a demand from one government to another. The example you can see right now, you just watch Trump and, and, and Putin. The Americans are screaming and hollering that they, they wanted Trump to be more tough with Putin, right? That conversation is two nations having a kind you know, having whatever. <clears throat> but that's what that is. There's two nations talking right there. Notice what every time you see them sit down, they always sit with a flag behind them. They represent the nation when they talk. That's why these Americans here is mad that the, the Trump is not representing them the way that they want him to be representing them. So we have to have that collective mentality of we are a nation of our own. First, you can be anything else you want to be second. Because folks in Nigeria is my cousins. Folks in Cuba, my family. I mean, if we're serious about this family and, and this Pan-African mindset, we have to see each other as family worldwide. You know, obviously we can deal with the negatives that our family members do. We do that in-house. The only way to do that is to have the structure. We can look at the ancestors in, in, in the old uh, the old country, okay, back at how the, the different kingdoms in Africa dealt with certain things. It was all tribunals, right? That's what the significance of the, uh, the anytime, any place music is here. Everything is, 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 is dealt with in the circle, you know? So I'm not joking when I say I will talk with you, your minister, your husband, your wife, your cousin, your mentor, your teacher, all right, your reverend, your rabbi, I'll talk at any of them at any time in any place. If it comes to uplifting our people, I'm down for doing that. All right, because we have to understand that that's this was set up for something greater than all of us. And that again gets me to the title of this move, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this live right here. You know what I'm saying? People have a tendency to think because I'm vocal about Garveyism that I want to be like some sort of the guy. <laughs> no, please believe it is my dream to impart all of this right here, this race firstness into all of anybody. So somebody can please come take over, <laughs> okay? Didn't have this much gray when I started, huh? This is a democratic system, by the way. So again, to explain what the UNIACL is, it's about, you know what I'm saying? You get a vote. Yeah, everybody's so happy about voting in democratic process. Like, yeah, that's what this is about. We supposed to, within ourselves, decide what's supposed to happen before we go out to the rest of the world. I'm gonna give you one last example and then I'm escaping. Again, I always talk about the Seneca Nation. I want y'all to Google them. Go look at their government structure. You 
some of y'all think that I'm joking when I use them as an example. They have an entire structure. They have a, a, an election process. They have an embassy, okay? And they gain benefits because of it outside of their government structure because they start here, then they go out. So again, when we're dealing with the uh, anytime, any place over here, right? What we're talking about is we all need to come together at a table. I'm going to say that I'm going to keep saying it to prove, first of all, my conviction in, in this, all right? But also because the invitation has never left. The, the plan is simple. Just what Garvey said. He, he Again, he had folks from all different uh, belief systems and doctrines. But the plan is simple. It is all of these different splinter organizations, all right, need to have one or more representatives at a table, all right? We all decide what is best for our people in these times and in this place. Then we go back out to our respective organizations and implement the plan. Um, I will say that when we see so much resistance to doing that, it, it, it brings some questions. So that is, that's there regardless. The invitation is there whether you guys accept it or not. You know what I'm saying? The invitation to sit down and hash out whatever, like I said, anytime, any place, it's always there. But the goal has to be unification and the goal has to be a real end game. People always say, yeah, man, the struggle is real or a, a luta continue or what is it? You know, struggle continue. But is struggling what we aim it for? Or are we really trying to win this thing? And then when we take a moment and say that, what does it mean when we say we're trying to win this thing? And to the Garvey, winning means a nation of our own. To the true Pan-African, our own everything is the solution. Our own government, our own nation, and eventually our own uh, landmass that we can call our own. I mean, it's simple. We need our own health care, our own schools. We need our own police force. We need our own Congress. All of this. And just because it's bold to say that don't mean we shouldn't try to uh, achieve it. So again, anytime, any place, please don't worry about uh, Facebook and all of the other stuff. Somebody you know has my number. Holla.